as we embark on what promises to be um, a challenging and I would hope historic consideration of how and uh, how best to reform the health care system of our country. Um, we're very fortunate to have a range of talent on this subcommittee on both sides of the aisle and it is my intention along with my friend Mr. Klein to try to draw upon each of those talents of the members of the subcommittee in the best way we can to produce ideas and a work product that meets the president's uh, mandate, the president's uh, challenge to try to enact legislation in 2009 that reforms our health care system. Uh, I've, I want to say from the outset how pleased I am to be able to share this responsibility with Mr. Klein for the second consecutive Congress. Um, he is a person who is well versed on the issues, is very easy to communicate with, uh, believes uh, deeply in his views and is a strong advocate for them, but is also a fair and balanced person. And it's a pleasure to work with him. And I feel privileged to have this opportunity once again. I'm uh, honored to be joined today by my science and technology advisor, my 16-year-old daughter, Jacqueline, who uh, was bitterly disappointed that she didn't get to go to the Usher hearing. This is her consolation prize. Small consolation indeed. And uh, also, please, I'm able to be joined by my, my cousin and her husband, Laurel Shaw and Walt Shaw. Uh, they're very important people in my life, and, and they give me a way to understand these issues. They're both retired educators. Uh, they work very hard for their health insurance over the years, and it's very important to them as, as they uh, continue in their lives. And they, among many other people, give me a prism through which I can understand these issues. So I'm delighted that you're here today. On Thursday at the White House, President Obama challenged the Congress and the country to enact health care reform legislation in 2009. This will be this subcommittee's first effort to meet that challenge and rise to the occasion. Um, the president, I think, very well articulated what most Americans want. I think he articulated the consensus of what Americans want when it comes to change in health insurance. First of all, I think most Americans want to choose their own doctor or health care provider. We feel very passionately that we want to be connected to the person we've chosen to be the pediatrician for our children or the OBGYN for our wives or daughters or uh, our own dentist, our own psychiatrist, whatever it is that we want to deal with. Americans feel very strongly about the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship and I believe we should do whatever we can to preserve and enhance that relationship. The second thing that I think most Americans believe about health care is it's costing them too much out of their take-home pay. Uh, health care out-of-pocket costs for Americans have risen about five times as quickly as wages have risen in the last decade or so. That means for a lot of Americans who are fortunate enough to have health insurance, to have a job, and to have received a pay increase in that job, that they very often find they took a pay cut anyway because their out-of-pocket contribution to health care went up by more than their paycheck did if they're among that uh, increasingly dwindling group that has a job and, and gets a pay raise. So I think most Americans understand that they want health care costs to eat up a smaller portion of their paycheck or their family wealth. That certainly goes for small businesses as well. Uh, small businesses, all businesses, but particularly small businesses, are struggling uh, to cover the people who work for them and their families and finding it increasingly difficult to do so. 169 million Americans derive their health insurance through an employer-employee relationship. And it is for that reason that this subcommittee and the full committee will be actively engaged in the process of writing and debating and eventually legislating bills on this subject. Um, there are different views about whether the employer-employee system should continue to be a basis for the provision of health care. I believe it should be but I understand there are different views. What I do assure all members of the subcommittee and the full committee is that we will have our full and robust opportunity to weigh in on that debate legislatively uh, as the year goes on because the employee-employer system is such an important part uh, of the care that's presently provided. This morning we're going to begin our examination of these issues 
with a focus on the question of how much it is costing employers who choose to insure uh, to help carry the burden of employees and dependents of those who do not insure. Now notice the formulation I use for this. Uh, employers who choose to insure is, is recognition of the fact that in virtually all cases in our country, the law today is that whether or not to insure one's employees is a matter of choice. We're very fortunate that many, many American employers make that choice and they cover collectively 169 million people. Other employers do not do so, some by choice and some by necessity. This uh, committee fully understands that there are millions of American entrepreneurs who are struggling to stay alive and it's, they're, they're not providing health insurance not because they're indifferent to their employees or because they do not understand the value of health insurance, but because providing health insurance would wipe out any net profit they have in their businesses. It's simply not a viable option for a lot of businesses in the country. There are other employers, however, who uh, are not insuring their employees as a matter of choice and not of necessity. And it's within their business purview under present law to make that choice. There are a variety of reasons for making that choice. Some are uh, presumptively legitimate, some are probably illegitimate. The purpose of today's hearing is to quantify and understand the cost of that choice that has been made. In other words, for employers who are in a position to provide health insurance but who choose not to, what happens to the people who are not insured and who pays for their care? This morning, I'm certain, as we meet, there are at least hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Americans receiving care in doctor's offices, hospitals, clinics, and other settings, uh, and they're not able to pay their bill. When they're not able to pay their bill, someone else pays for it. We have a system in this country, and I'm thankful that we do, that people are not turned away, at least they're not supposed to be turned away, when they approach an emergency room or another health care provider and don't have an insurance card. I don't want to live in a country where people are turned away under those circumstances. But when they are accepted in that emergency room or accepted in that medical practice, someone pays for the care that they receive. In some cases, that someone is a health care institution or provider who simply eats the cost and provides free or reduced price care. In other cases, that cost is passed along to other people who pay premiums in the health care system, in which case the cost is passed along to each of us who pays health care premiums in some way. In other respects, that cost is passed along to taxpayers when uninsured people are covered by public programs, whether at the state or federal level. So our focus this morning is going to be to focus in on the question of how much is it costing for the employees uh, uh, who are not insured when they access health care and who's paying for it? I think that's an important question as we go forward to frame this discussion again. I'm very grateful to have a chance to work with the colleagues that we have on this subcommittee. We're very grateful for this morning's panel.